Joburg Magistrates Court has ruled that Patrick Keregea has been killed, was killed by people directly linked to the Rwandan government. The former Rwandan general fled to South Africa and was found murdered in a posh hotel in 2014. So let's unpack the story now. So joining me for this conversation is ENCA's Kaili Kumalo. Kaili always a pleasure having you Thank on you Newsnight. So now this is a story that dates back, I mean, 2013, 2014, we heard much about it in the media. It's quite interesting that, uh, you know, the Ramberg matches just caught. Actually, we heard that they've been waiting for the NPA to actually make a decision around following the four suspects that we know as South Africa, um, you know, and we've got their identity on hand and finally bring this case somehow to trial. What's been happening since 2013? So it's a very protracted battle, like you say, faith. So today we got an opportunity of speaking to the weeder. So really expressing uh, their sheer delight in light of the developments uh, at the Randberg Madstrad Court. Mm. So uh, there's quite a lot at play here because we know that South Africa and Rwanda, they have very frosty uh, bilateral relations, especially after 2014. We know that a very bold step was taken by the two countries where diplomats were recalled in two capitals in Pretoria and Kigali. So even now to this point, and mainly because the argument was that that South Africa is harboring dissidents. So even, um, you know, the late uh, Colonel Karagir is categorized uh, as a dissident in Kigali. So it's an issue really that has been ongoing for some time. Yeah. But from the side of the widow, they are saying from their side, they're extremely excited uh, now that the magistrate has indicated that now the National Prosecuting Authority must go back and really try and, and really just make sure that justice prevails. Yeah, but then will the NPA actually make that kind of decision? Because as we heard from the Randburg Magistrate Court, as well as the, the officer, the investigating officer, so that was actually following this case, saying that the reason why it's taken so long to even to even follow up on the suspects, the four suspects that we know of or that they know of, um, whose identity they've got um, in their possession, the reason why it was difficult to actually follow up on this case is simply because of the politics that are involved between Rwanda as well as South Africa. Furthermore to that, also bringing in the prosecutor, Gerinel, who's now at his wit's end, saying that, in fact, you know, he, he, he's trying to bring justice to, to, to the family um, of the deceased and to the wife specifically, who wants those names known, who wants those suspects to actually be brought to trial. Well, undoubtedly, it's going to be a massive challenge because, so when you look at South Africa and Rwanda, they don't have extradition treaties. So that mm. could have been easily to try and extradite the four suspects. And also the magistrate was very categorical in saying that these people are linked to the government of uh, Rwanda. So the four suspects that absolutely. actually were, okay, okay. Absolutely. And also what is very interesting here is that it appears to be a well orchestrated plan, really, because so when you look at countries like South Africa, Belgium, the UK, so all those who are, you know, categorized as dissidents, some there has been attempt in their lives, some have died under very mysterious circumstances. So hence you have uh, people like the RNS, RNC, so that's a party that in Rwanda is seen as a terrorist organization, mm. but in all fairness, it's an opposition party. But in R Rwanda, really, they're not given that status. Okay, then in this case then, um, would Rwanda then tell South Africa in quite simple terms to back off the case? Because if these individuals are trialed, do they get trialed as Rwandan citizens that, get, that, create, that committed a crime on South African soil? And therefore, I mean, you're saying that there is no extradition treaty that is in place. So then what happens to these individuals? Do they get jailed for crimes that they committed? And if the crime was committed on behalf of the Rwandan government, does that then not exonerate them simply because they were acting under the auspice or the instruction of the Rwandan government itself. Precisely. So it's going to be a massive battle because now, so the ball is really on the NPA's court to decide whether they, they will go ahead with the prosecution. We know that at some point uh, the NPA was recommending an inquest and uh, the defense was saying, uh, you know, to all intents and purposes, uh, they know the suspects. So what they should do, they should try to bring them back here in South Africa. So the so, suspects have left the country. The suspects are now in Rwanda um, and, and yet we know who the those four suspects are who've been accused of this crime. 
So we do know the suspects. We know the identities. There is a CCTV footage that was sourced from uh, the Porsche Hotel here in Johannesburg. So it's really going to be a complex situation, Faith, because we know that a lot of business people between the two countries, for example, have been struggling in getting visas. So there has been a commitment from the side of President Cyril Ramaphosa that they are prioritizing this issue. Mm. But now at this point, one of the main challenges, for example, to get a reaction from the South African authorities. They're really not forthcoming with the information. So we've really been battling to try and source their reaction in light of the developments at Sarandberg Magistrate Court where the magistrate was very strict in saying, listen, uh, the NPA really must make sure that justice prevails here. But at it's the expense, really, if you look at justice prevailing, might just be at the expense of uh, relations or bilateral relations between Rwanda as well as South Africa already adding to in a frosty uh, relationship and not an excuse, obviously, for making individuals walk away who committed a really horrendous crime. But what, what does that say about the bilateral relations as well? It's a rock and a hard place at this moment. Well, absolutely, Faith, especially because so a lot of experts as well, they go as far as saying that the territorial integrity of South Africa was violated in, in this case. Mm. So in essence, if you have the hitman really coming into the country, committing a heinous crime and then fleeing, so... In essence, really, a lot of violation uh, just happened in that particular instance. But the family is not giving up hope. Yeah, and they, Karen Al is not giving up hope. Absolutely, especially because now the option is if the NPA is failing, the private prosecution will serve as a last resort. So that will be a very unfortunate situation because uh, now there is a very sense of optimism that the family is saying, listen, perhaps the NPA will go back to the drawing boards and really try and make sure that this time successfully they prosecute uh, in this particular matter. But like you said, at the very great expense of the diplomatic relations, but obviously South Africa will have to play very smart here, whether do they want to see justice happening or do they want the economic relations. So it's a very, very tough situation here. Sure. Rock in a hard place there. Kailiso, thanks a lot for joining us this evening, shedding some light in terms of those developments around the case of Rwandan intelligence head. That's the former head who was deceased in 2013, Patrick Karegeya there. Now, authorities are investigating whether the church building that